Hey, hello everybody. I'm Dennis Borrell with the Coalition of Texans with Disabilities, and we're here at Cinema Touching Disability. I've just seen an incredible film called Not Going Quietly, a documentary featuring self-advocate A.D. Barkin. And Mr. Barkin is, was an individual who uh, had an acquired disability in his late 20s and became, uh, since then, very active in advocacy as a self-advocate a person with a disability advocating for disability rights and services. And that describes our two guests today on our wraparound panel, Rene Lopez and Danny Sines, both of whom are incredibly active in advocacy. Uh, and I've seen them both many, many times in uh, hearings and or demonstrations in the Capitol, speaking from podiums, doing interviews. These are amazing advocates. And in, in our world, we refer to self-advocates as those who have the lived experience with disabilities. And um, these are two of the best. So let's start with you. Uh, we'll start with the same question for both of you. Uh, Renee, if you'll answer first, how long have you been involved in advocating for disability rights? I actually uh, first got involved myself when I went to UT. And um, back in 1981, and um, I found a group of people with disabilities at the dorm where I was living, and um, they were fighting for accessibility and uh, fighting for public transportation uh, to for the buses, the shuttles to be made accessible or to have us not have to pay for it since we didn't have access to it. And um, we formed a, a fraternity and we called it PEB, People Against Barriers. And that's where I started my advocacy. And, uh, but actually, as I was thinking about this a minute ago, I, um, my advocacy actually started years before with my mother when I watched her advocate for me in school to be um, mainstreamed. I was in special education and kept in one room and my mother wanted me to be part of the the uh, classroom uh, with other students and not just locked away in a room, a special room. <laughs> so I remember watching her advocate and I think that's where I learned it from. Oh, that's fantastic. How about you, Danny? How long have you been involved in advocating? Well, I moved to Austin in 86 and I think I started getting involved in late 89 and uh, I definitely uh, 1990. Uh, I kept getting these postcards from people, Bob Kafka and Stephanie Thomas, invited me to an ADAPT meeting. And so I finally said, okay, I'll go. And so I went and happened to be where they were planning an action. And it was the same thing with uh, bus transportation. They weren't allowing certain types of wheelchairs on board. We had already had lists when I got here, which was a great, you know, advance. I was coming from Corpus Christi and we didn't have anything like that. And so uh, because of the previous advocacy, there was already some lists on the bus, but the Metro decided they were going to uh, require certain certain types of, of, of uh, securements for people with certain wheelchairs, they weren't gonna work with them. And so uh, we were there back at that time in front of the bus, uh, in front of the Capitol and uh, we did our, our form of advocacy there, and then it, it wound up, you know, we wound up getting it. And but the same thing with us growing up uh, with my disability, and and my mother, my my father, advocating, and uh, always getting the uh, encouragement, you know, uh, you know, to to not to let anything stop you, you know. Uh, my mother's mantra was, when there's or if there's a will, there's a way. Now, I remember during the 70s, uh, before the, uh, they have the access um, on the north side, walking up the south side steps, because that was the entrance. That The whole capital entrance, that's another thing that's, that also kind of, a, you know, you know uh, what do you call it? Having to go back to the back door, because essentially the north side is the capital's back door. Um, and uh, yeah, it was all walking up the, the south steps, my crutches. 
And then the insult for injury, I was walking in at that time. I had some uh, wooden uh, tripods kind of things. And I went to visit my uh, state senator. And when I got home, it was summer vacation. When I got back, they asked my, my school, they asked me if I enjoyed my trip to Austin. So how did you know we went to Austin? So well, Senator uh, Thrawn uh, called up and asked if there was anything better for you crutches wise. Because apparently I was making too much noise. Uh, well, walking down the, <laughs> what, the house, well, I well, didn't know what, what kind of met, uh, how loud we, I could get <laughs> later on. <laughs> they thought that was loud. Yeah. <laughs> but I can uh, think uh, of that. Uh, uh, yeah, I will say that I've 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 been in the Capitol building when I heard a lot of loud people, and you, the two of you, were among them. <laughs> and can you give us an example of maybe a, a specific advocacy thing that you did that made, that went really well, or maybe one that didn't go well? First, I want to say that advocacy, when you're advocating for something, it doesn't happen right away. You have to be very persistent, and um, so that's so actually. All advocacy is difficult because you have to really believe in what you're fighting for and you have to be persistent. Sometimes it takes it takes years. You know, I mean, I've been I've been an advocate for over 40 years now and, um, you know, it doesn't get any easier. Uh, most of them have been successful, um, but a lot of them. Well, the main one I have right now that I consider to not be very successful is in fighting to get. Um, higher wages for attendance, personal care attendance. And we've been fighting that for probably going on six or seven, eight years now, maybe longer. I can't remember. I've lost track. And we still can't get past um, minimum wage for attendance, especially the ones that work through Medicaid or certain programs. Um, they did raise it a couple of years ago from minimum wage of, what is it, seven fifty four, something like that? to $8.11. Yes. And that's how much attendants are getting paid right now. And we're still fighting it and still fighting it. And we have an action plan coming up soon to continue asking for higher wages for attendant care because attendant care has become a crisis. Uh, there are many people who um, are having more difficulty living in the community because they can't find any attendants. Well, you who wants to work for eight dollars and eleven cents an hour when you can work at, you know, at Burger King for fifteen dollars, right. and uh, you know that's been <clears throat> that's been one of the things that I've said when I speak before the legislature that I feel less than a hamburger because you know someone who flips a burger is going to make more money than somebody who comes to my house to help me survive, and uh, but that doesn't seem to <laughs> doesn't make a dent because. We just haven't been able to get higher wages, but we'll just keep on trying. I'll be there with you. Danny, can you think of an example of advocacy that either one that worked or one that didn't work? Um, yes. When I was in, in college, uh, there's this place that we like to go to. And uh, uh, even though I was in the, uh, they didn't have a special classroom, but uh, so I was, you know, integrated, but I was, we got involved with the other disabled students. And so, you know, so we used to go down to this uh, place at the best uh, stuffed potatoes, I guess you call them. And, but we had our, to have our friends, uh, able body friends lift us up. You know, that's the way you did things. And so uh, we did it. And then finally one time, I don't know what it was, without any kind of, you know, just so we sort of just asked. And the guy says, yeah, I built a ramp. This was in the 80s, so I don't, I don't remember. I don't think it was anything like what, what we would have today, but still, it was it made it a lot easier to go in there. Um, and it was a small town. Um, so I think, and I, yeah, I know that that's, that was a kind of a fluke, you know, because I agree with Renee, it takes take a lot, lot, lot longer. And it takes a long time to move a mountain. And, uh, these are these are mountains. And speaking of mountains, um, I know both of you are aware of this, but I suspect that many of our viewers may not be. But the state of Texas claims sovereign immunity when they violate the civil rights 
of a person with a disability under the Americans with Disabilities Act. This could be a, for example, a student at UT like Renee had been, if her civil rights had been violated there, the state would be immune from any, you know, any, any violation that they do. How does that make you feel when, when there's a federal law that's supposed to protect the civil rights of people with disabilities and, and your home state says that we don't have to follow that law? It made me really angry, uh, especially when we have a governor who's in a wheelchair. And uh, so I was really upset about that. And um, I found that if, not that we want to go out and sue everybody, you know, that's not, but that's not our intention with the law. Uh, we, we have various things that we do first to try and get accessibility, but suing people is not really what we want to do. But uh, if worse comes to worse, we'll, we'll do it. And uh, to not be able to sue someone, um, then you can't hold somebody accountable. And if you can't hold somebody accountable, then you're not going to make the change you need. And um, so I, I found I find it very frustrating um, and very disappointing. What advice? What advice would you give those like a young person? We said, hey, hey guys, you've been doing this a while. I want to join the fight. What would you tell them? Renee, what would you tell that person? Um, I would tell them that um, you have to learn to speak from your heart and uh, don't think about what the other person's going to think and don't, I mean, don't get self-conscious about it. Um, because I think if you speak from your heart, it, it lands better, you know, it's, it's, it's not like you're, it's not rhetoric, you know, it's not lip service. You're really speaking from your heart and soul because uh, it, it means something to you and you have to get that across. And um, another thing I would say is uh, find your passion. You know, we all have different uh, accessibility issues. Uh, people with uh, blindness or uh, vision impairments and people who are deaf, are going to have different issues than someone who's in a wheelchair. And uh, so, you know, think about what do, you, what do you want in your life? Do you want to live in uh, a community with everybody else in an accessible apartment? Uh, do you want to work? Do you want to have a job, a full-time job and make, uh, you know, an adequate uh, salary that where you can purchase a home or something? Uh, do you want transportation? Uh, and it, so it's just whatever issue appeals to you, whatever means something to you uh, that you need to speak up. Um, I remember, I'll, I'll tell this story because Danny was saying how he's an introvert and I was very shy myself and uh, I was afraid to speak up. You know, I didn't want to rock the boat. I didn't want to upset anybody because that's another way I grew up. I, was, I grew up being told to, you know, children should be seen and not heard and you don't speak up, you don't talk back to adults, you know, all this stuff. And, and I was very shy because I knew I was different. And uh, so uh, one time I talked to my friend, Nancy, who is also an advocate, well known in Austin. Right. And I said, gosh, I wish I could be like you, you know, and uh, I wish I could, you know, I wish I had what you've got. I don't, I don't have it. I'm too quiet. I'm shy. And she says, uh, you need to find your voice. You know, just keep at it. Just keep, you know, keep at uh, advocacy. Keep speaking up. Eventually, you'll find it, and it gets easier. And um, but you do have to keep at it, and just know what it is you want, what change you want to see, and uh, th that would be my advice. That's fantastic. And before you answer, Danny, on what advice you would give, so Renee, this is we're recording this today, but tomorrow. You'll be speaking before tens of thousands of people live, right? Right. Yeah. Nervous about that? Uh, I am nervous about it because this is, it's probably going to be the biggest group I've ever spoken before. Uh, but again, I, I know that when I get up there, I'm going to have to just think about it's not about me. You know, it's not about Renee. It's about a group of people that are fighting for their rights. And when I get into that mode, I know that I'll, I'll be able to speak up because it's not it's not going to be about me or what people think about me or how I look or it, it has nothing to do with that. It has to do with rights. 
Yeah, the people that think that you know it can't happen to them, even even as a as a person with a disability, my uh, need for mm -hmm. a level of support has grown as I gotten older. So even if you're already disabled, chances are you'll need more uh, services. And uh, and the same thing with you know what Renee was saying about find out what you you know because usually. If something you think is wrong, something you don't like, there's probably other people that feel the same way you do. You know, like, you know what? I wish this place was, had, they have great tacos, but I wish their taco truck was accessible. Well, let's go talk to them. And that's the other thing, too, because joining with other people, I think it's more effective. Um, you know, finding somebody that, that you can, uh, that shares your concerns. Uh, yeah, because like I was saying, when I, I uh, uh, got involved with the DAP, it was it was just sort of my my image for that whole experience. My first experience was like a fish in the water, just set me in it, and I took off. I just like I, it, you know, I was like born for this. One thing I want to add, uh, Dennis, that yes. I forgot to mention is um, when you do go speak before the legislature. For example, I had to remember that they work for me and the Capitol is the people's house. And, you know, I have every right to be there as much as anybody else. And, uh, I, you know, when I realized that they work for me, we voted them in there, we can vote them out. Um, they, they work for us. And that's one thing to remember. So you're not so intimidated because, you know, a lot of them are, are dressed in these power suits and power dresses. And you feel like they have a lot of power and control and maybe they do, you know, but that doesn't mean that they don't work for you or that they're not there to listen to you. So we've been on the, the journey to self-advocacy with Renee Lopez and Danny Sines, and this has been a great conversation.